On this edition of Exposé, alarming lapses in airport security. Guns were still getting through, bomb making material was still getting through, and an IED strapped to a woman's leg got through. And reporters flying under the radar. You know, I could go over to Hooks and hop in any plane and take, take off in it. Funding for Exposé has been provided by wrong with local news. There is a lot of mother and daughter getting breast implants together stories tonight at 10 and a whole lot of things that I'm not proud of in this industry, but there are a handful of shops that are, that are trying to do it the right way. A handful of shops, one in Phoenix, one in Houston, one in Denver, have taken the lead in covering a national story, airport security. You would think five years after 9-11 that airports would be very secure. Well, what you're about to see may have you thinking twice about the level of security Sky Harbor Airport is providing. In July 2007, Lisa Fletcher received a call telling her that something was amiss at Phoenix, Arizona's Sky Harbor Airport. I have a source at the airport, and that person has been a terrific source for the last five years. The person called me, and they said, go to the airport, sit out there at night. I said, you've got to keep our names out of it, but here's what's going on. Please check it out. The source told Fletcher to make a trip to the airport late at night. She did, joined by fellow reporter Jonathan Elias. We were acting like we were a couple going on vacation, and we'd missed our plane, so we had to camp out in the airport. We had this elaborate setup with our hidden camera in our suitcase handle, and we were being very discreet. We immediately went out and started checking around, and then when we saw it actually happening, that's when our jaws just banged holes right in the floor. We couldn't believe it. And I got a call at 5 o'clock the next morning, you're not going to believe what we found. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> I'm like, you're kidding. Well, we got to go back. So went back a second night, and it was the same thing. What the reporters saw and what their hidden camera recorded was that beginning at midnight, person after person, bag after bag, cart after cart, went straight through security without being screened. And we were close enough to the checkpoint that we really saw everything that was coming and going. Suitcases, giant cleaning carts. At one point, a guy wheels up this thing of newspapers that if you wanted to put a bomb in there, I mean, a giant bomb, you could just hide it in the newspapers and wheel it right on through. The reporters were shocked. They had assumed that people and bags were always screened at all airports by trained officers of the Transportation Security Administration. The TSA was created after the 9-11 attacks to strengthen and oversee security for the nation's transport systems. But at midnight that night in Phoenix, Fletcher and Elias watched the TSA pack up and move out. The metal detectors and x-ray machines were turned off and a non-TSA security guard took over. See this giant opening right here? This is where everybody comes through to get in with TSA. But come over here, let me show you something. This little portal, this is where you'd come in between 12 and 5 o'clock in the morning. And the only thing between you and getting into what is considered a sterile part of the airport is a podium with a security guard. After that first night, Fletcher and Elias became bolder. Still posing as vacationers, they approached one of the security guards with a handheld camera. He suggested he sometimes had trouble staying alert on the job. Sometimes he did. The reporters learned from further conversations that the guards were employed by a call security. A call was contracted by the city of Phoenix to take over for the TSA between the hours of midnight and 4.30 a.m. We said, what kind of training do you have? Are you trained to identify a false badge from a real badge? Because that's all he does is look at the badge and check it off on his check sheet. And he said, no. 
We don't get any kind of training like that. We watch a video, we get our uniform, and we come here. Fletcher and Elias also asked their sources at the airport if there was a second layer of security. No, they were told. This was it. And we did it night after night because we didn't want to give the airport the opportunity to come back and say, that was an anomaly. You know, you guys caught us on an off night. So we went night after night after night, and it kept happening over and over and over. At that point, it was just a matter of finding really a terrific expert that could look at this and say, big deal, not a big deal. Because from our perspective at that moment, it was a big deal. Fletcher contacted Larry Wansley, the former head of security for American Airlines. He now consults internationally on security and anti-terrorism. This is at the same checkpoint. Same checkpoint. One minute later. You've got the front door TSA that has locked it up for the better part of the day, the majority of the day, and then you throw open the back door. And, and I'm appalled. I'm shocked and I'm amazed. When we heard him say that, we just sort of went, wow, this is even bigger than we thought. We're not security experts, but we had to go back and study what do airports do, what have they done historically, what did they do post 9-11, what kinds of safeguards have been put in place, what airports have to and what airports don't have to. And it was tough. The reporters learned that the TSA puts its screeners through weeks of training to learn how to spot and intercept weapons, including firearms and explosive devices. Fletcher says the non-TSA security guards told her they don't get training like that. The journalists also learned from a leaked City of Phoenix document that it was policy for non-TSA guards not to search people or their personal items. Here it is in their own writing on their own letterhead. This was really their plan. This is what they set out to do. This was their intention. This wasn't a mistake. Fletcher and Elias then decided to put it all on the table for airport officials. We wanted to speak with the director of the airport, but the director of the airport didn't return our calls. Then we tried to talk to the assistant city manager. He wouldn't talk to us. We called the city manager himself. He wouldn't talk to us. We called the mayor's office, and we said, look, we need the mayor to do something. Somebody needs to talk to us about this. And none of them did. We ended up going on the air with nothing more than a statement that was a combined statement from regional TSA and the airport that said it's all in compliance with federal regulations. We discovered four and a half hours a night where virtually anything can be brought into the secure side of the airport. The x-ray machines are off, the metal detectors closed, and bags with unknown contents are carried to the secure side of the airport where the planes are. Even a guy with his bike just shows his ID and rides away. His crate on the back never checked. It was a firestorm. As soon as the story hit the air, it was a firestorm. The story was too big for the city of Phoenix to ignore. This time, when the station called the mayor, Phil Gordon, he agreed to go on the air. He told Fletcher that public safety was the city's top priority. And since safety is a top priority, what was your reaction when you saw what our hidden cameras captured night after night? The security checkpoint entry is not the only point of security. This is a safe airport, and this is a safe airport not only through this mayor's eyes, but our police officers' eyes, as well as the federal government's eyes. I'll tell you, uh, Mayor, that some of our sources are police officers that do not feel that it's safe because of the circumstances that are occurring there. Let's talk about these bags that are coming through for four and a half hours a night with unknown contents. Well, why, let's talk let, about let's, that. First, though, I'd like to address the fact that these experts are in the private sector whose bottom line is to make money, whose bottom line is to get contracts increasing security throughout the country, not only airports, not only in Phoenix, but throughout the country. My job is to get the privilege to sit there in front of a public official that most people never get to sit in front of and ask the questions that are burning in their minds. Can you guarantee to the citizens of Phoenix and the people flying out of Sky Harbor that the contents of those bags are screened beyond that checkpoint. I can guarantee that our officers, our security personnel, and the federal government are doing everything that they can do to keep this a safe city as well as a safe country. And you know, at some point, as a reporter too, you think if I ask the question enough times, I'm eventually going to wear them down and they're going to answer the question because I'm going to drive them crazy. Every employee, 24 hours a day, is screened. Their bags aren't screened, though, Phil. Employees are screened. Lisa? Their bags are screened. The employees are screened. The employees are screened. That means they get a badge check. There are other measures in place, too. Are their bags checked? 
there, there are measures in place that secure that airport 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whether TSA is manning their machines or not. He finally said it. He goes, Lisa, we could go round and round with this all day. We could. Are we going to? Or are you going to answer the question? Are these bags checked? We broke the story about serious security risks at Sky Harbor Airport, and now the TSA is taking action. They have just flown in to oversee changes that they're putting in place because of our undercover investigation. Just three days after the story aired, the TSA suspended the federal security director at Sky Harbor and put TSA screeners back on round-the-clock duty. My friend and I were talking and having a conversation. And he's a pilot. He said, Keith, he says, you know, I could go over to Hooks and hop in any plane and take, take off in it. I originally thought we were just talking about Cessnas. He says, no, Keith, he says, there's jets out there. I said, the ones in front of the terminal? He says, yeah. He goes, one key fits any of those. So from that conversation, I knew that was a story. Keith Tomshe works as a journalist and photographer for KHOU's investigative unit in Houston. He brought his idea to correspondent Jeremy Rogalski and executive producer David Razik. Doing some research, they were surprised to find that when it comes to security, not all airports are alike. After 9-11, all efforts were made on commercial airports, and for good reason, but there are 19,000 other airports that are virtually going unnoticed. Now, some of them are as small as literally a, a dirt strip in the middle of a cornfield. But others, as we found, are very much thriving, small airports with a lot of corporate jet and executive uh, traffic and are real players in the aviation industry. Of course, you know, the beginning was, let's go visit the airports. Tom, she would first test the security at Hooks Airport, 30 miles from downtown Houston. The biggest obstacle in all of this was going to do the undercover work. If it didn't happen, if he didn't get in, we didn't have that story. I picked this entrance out of the two because, I mean, I felt kind of at home. It said, welcome. It says, come on in for a deli sandwich, now open. So I thought, well, that should be pretty easy to get into. There's no, uh, you know, nothing I have to be deceitful about that. So the first time I came, I pressed the button and, uh, you know, asked if the deli was open. and. They opened the door and let me in. Good morning, and thank you for calling Hook. This is first time I help you. Good morning. Can you open her up for me? You got to pick the right person to go in there. And Keith just has a strong air of innocence about him. And so that actually sort of hedges, you know, in your favor. The camera's actually right here in the center. Um, the glasses look like maybe they're from the 70s. I always joke around. But the funniest thing is, is that the first time I went out, I said, man, this is going to totally give me away. These glasses are so obvious, you know. But when you put them on, I think maybe they don't realize it's a hidden camera because they're so distracted on how funny I look in them. I don't know <laughs> if that's the case or what. Tom, she made his rounds to two more airports on the outskirts of Houston. At Sugarland, he walked right through the terminal and onto the tarmac. When newsrooms use hidden cameras for hidden cameras' sake, people are starting to read through that. You know, back in the 80s, it was, we went undercover with our hidden cameras, you know, and it was the gym bag with the, with the round circles or, you know, the, the round kind of periscope thing through the gym bag as you go explore dirty restaurants or something. However, there are some stories where you cannot get to unless you do have a hidden camera. At the third airport, Lone Star, Tom she was able to walk right up and touch a commercial jet on the tarmac. Okay, so I'm gonna walk out here. You can walk right up and just probably just go like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Houston has one of the largest concentrations of chemical plants in the country. If attacked from the air, they could spew out toxins potentially killing thousands. Houston had a unique one-two punch. We have these security gaps in several airports, 
and you could be up and you could be down in our chemical alley in under five minutes time. Both these elements fit perfectly together. One was the delivery system and the problems and uh, the other one w was the consequences. After a nearly two month investigation, the story made air. While Uncle Sam spends billions a year on commercial airport security, thousands of smaller general aviation airports are almost going unnoticed. And experts say that leaves the door wide open, sometimes literally, for a terrorist to steal a plane. To the Sugarland Regional Airport. It's got a luxurious new terminal, but a fence that doesn't go all the way around. After the story ran, <laughs> one guy came up to me and just said, that was goddamn scary. I'm really worried. What are they going to do? One of those who saw the broadcast was Houston area Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, who requested that the Department of Homeland Security investigate. You know, one of the things I've asked TSA to do this year is to go back and look at the general aviation sector and see where do we need to tighten up. When we called up a couple months later to say, hey, how's that investigation coming that our Congresswoman requested? And they said, well, it's not in the budget this year. And we're going to have to wait to next year. What does that go back to? Perhaps the cost-benefit analysis. Until a disaster occurs, until the body count starts accumulating, are we going to be reactionary or are we going to be proactive as a government? Deborah Sherman has built her reputation on Homeland Security stories, staking out the territory even before there was a Department of Homeland Security. In 2001, working for a Fox affiliate in Boston, Sherman filed a story about shockingly lax security at area airports, including Boston Logan. She and her news team got suspicious metal objects, even a large knife, past airport screeners. We are now behind the security checkpoint, and the screeners didn't find this metal device that she had on or this money belt that our photographer was wearing. It was just four months before 9-11. Six years later, working in Denver at KUSA, she got a tip about Denver International Airport. In one of my conversations with a source inside the TSA, he said, the red team's been here. And I knew what that meant. Sherman knew the Red Team was a covert operations force overseen by the TSA that secretly tests security at airports by trying to get simulated weapons, including bombs, past its screeners. And I said, what were the results? And he said, oh, we failed. We failed miserably. I had no idea we were this bad. In Denver, it was a sheet of plastic explosives in a suitcase. It was a book bomb in a suitcase. One undercover agent, sources tell us, wore an IED, an improvised explosive device, strapped to her leg. All the alarms and whistles are going off, right? The metal detectors are working. And the undercover agent said, oh, I had surgery, and she was able to walk her way past. Deborah came in with her first tip, and reporters usually come in, you know, they're snoopy in the, in, in the first place. I mean, they come in we got to get this on the air right away, you know, and they stand there kind of like they have to go to the bathroom, you know, and we got to get this, we got to get this. I think any time a reporter comes to you and says, I have a story or, or some information that challenges the security of the people that we serve, you have to say that's an important story. Sherman knew that getting absolute proof of the Red Team's results would be nearly impossible. She had been trying to learn about the Red Team since before the TSA was created. In fact, I asked the uh, FAA once about the red team, and they wouldn't even acknowledge that it existed. Sherman worked her sources inside the TSA, who had firsthand knowledge of the red team's results at Denver. They confirmed what her original source had told her. We usually try to meet somewhere kind of far away, uh, maybe even close to where they live in a um, kind of small joint, whether it's a we try to meet in a coffee shop or a really small restaurant or just an out-of-the-way place. Once we started making calls on the red team, our sources really started to get worried. They claimed they were followed home. They claimed that their phone records were being looked into. They claimed that they were pulled into rooms and sat down and said, you're going to lose your job unless you admit that you've talked to Nine News. 
To protect the identity of their sources, Sherman and her executive producer, Nicole Vapp, came up with a plan. They flooded the agency with phone calls. We just started down the list. Hi, I'm Deborah Sherman. I'm calling from Channel 9. We know that there was a red team in town and that they found this information. And so every single person who worked there who had any access to this information had gotten a call from us. I thought I had this information enough ways from enough different sources independently, all telling me the same thing, that I was good to go with the story. But when I had discussions with um, my producer, Nicole, and my boss, Patty, um, they said, no, you need more. Deborah is a bit of a pit bull. She does not give up easy, uh, not only with people that she is trying to get information from, but with her managers. But if you have five sources, but they're all in the same circle, I think you have to say my job is to step outside of that circle and see if I can't get that information verified and or attributed to someone um, just to be very, very sure that what we're being told is the absolute truth. Sherman, BAP, and News Director Patty Dennis realize that if you're looking for classified information, one place to start is Congress. Now, the problem is most of our congressmen don't have any idea what a red team is and has never heard of the red team. I did not know about the red team, but I did know about Deborah Sherman. It sounded pretty serious, and I wanted to hear what she had to say. Ed Perlmutter, who represents the Denver area and sits on the House Homeland Security Committee, asked the TSA for a briefing. So I was able, by being a member of the committee, to uh, contact the TSA and say, what is going on here? I heard this from one of our local reporters, is there any substance to this? And they got an immediate reaction from them. Now, the only problem with that was um, Perlmutter had now just been given classified information and couldn't now tell us what he knew because it was classified. But what he did not do is correct us. And what he did not do is tell us we were wrong. And so from his responses, we knew that our sources were right on the money. Deborah Sherman finally had all the pieces she needed. We've learned screeners at DIA last month failed to stop undercover agents packing bombs and other weapons. Sources say agents snuck in improvised explosive devices and liquid explosives. Each time, the screening machines worked and alarms went off. Sources say it was human failure. Screeners did not follow standard operating procedures, opening and hand-searching luggage, or wanding and patting down the agents, missing the bombs. Why did screeners fail? They say they're pressured to get passengers on planes and are short-staffed. There used to be 1,100 at DIA, but after Congress capped funding, today there are 750. Sherman interviewed the head of TSA, Earl Morris, who wouldn't confirm the red team's results and told her the tests were designed to be difficult. If we wanted to, we could put these tests together so that we had 100% success rate every single time. Then they wouldn't be challenging, they wouldn't be realistic. But Sherman's sources told her no matter how the tests were designed, the simulated weapons that got through were just plain obvious. The red team members say, oh, we're not sneaking things past them in five different components and then reassembling it behind the screening checkpoint and saying, aha, here's a bomb, we, you know, fooled you. They're actually bringing these fully completed weapons that are, are the greatest simulants available to chemical explosives and they're walking them through the checkpoint or putting them in their luggage through the checkpoint and they're not being detected. One person in this story he called it security theater. We have people getting wanded and people taking their shoes off and you have to put all your lipstick in a little plastic bag. But when it gets right down to it, this report showed that guns were still getting through, bomb making material was still getting through and an IED strapped to a woman's leg got through. And it wasn't because the machines didn't show it. It was because people let them through. It was a, a human error. To me, the most remarkable thing is that before 9-11, when we tested security, it was really horrible. Today, six years after 9-11, after millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, screeners are still failing to find weapons which could be getting on airplanes.
funding for expose has been provided by